To understand this story, we have to go back before the beginning, because we know about the 1882 project and the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, but we cannot start in 1882. We must go back to 1870. In 1870, America's naturalization laws were under review. The first Naturalization Act in the United States passed in 1790. Who could become a citizen of this country? And the first Congress of the United States said that only white people could become citizens. Well, in the years since that time, there was a civil war. And the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments were ratified into the Constitution. Times had changed. It's the moment to update the laws. On July the 2nd, 1870, an update is on the floor of the United States Senate, and Charles Sumner, senator from Massachusetts, rises. Senator Sumner was an abolitionist. He was a radical Republican. He was an ally of Abraham Lincoln's. He was at Lincoln's deathbed after Lincoln was assassinated in Ford's theater. That was Charles Sumner. And he rose on the floor on July 2nd, 1870 to present an amendment. And the amendment essentially said this, that the words white must be stricken from the naturalization laws and that no person in the United States could be denied the right of naturalization on the basis of race. The amendment passed that Saturday afternoon. It passed, but then rose a senator from Nevada named William Stewart. And Stewart was concerned about 100,000 Chinese males on the Pacific coast of the United States, mostly rail workers, who might actually naturalize into the United States and change the political balance on the Pacific coast. And he said, that amendment is not going in this bill. And if that amendment is going to go in this bill, this bill is going to be filibustered. Congress was looking at a July 15th adjournment at that time, there was no remedy in the Senate against the filibuster. Filibusters were not as common in the 19th century, but when they happened, they were fatal. So the only way to stop the filibuster was for the person who was doing the filibustering to desist, and they asked him to desist, but he refused that Saturday evening. Sunday, they didn't work, but they came back on the 4th of July, 1870, to work again, and they went till 11 o'clock at night and Sumner could not get his amendment through because Senator Stewart would not desist. And so finally, in order to take the logjam away, to remove the clog from the legislative pipeline, they took out the Sumner Amendment from the bill. They reconsidered it and removed it, passed an amendment to allow people of African descent to naturalize, and they closed the legislation. After it was over, a senator who had been concerned about the Stewart filibuster said, look, we knew that this matter was controversial to a few people, so we decided we'd do this thing in two segments. First, we would take care of the Africans, and then we'd take care of the Chinese. And in two segments, they did. But the segments were 73 years apart. No person of Chinese descent born anywhere in the world outside of the United States could become a citizen of this country until 1943 when the Chinese exclusion laws were repealed. If Sumner's amendment had passed, those Chinese on the Pacific coast would have been voters. And if they had been voters, they would not have been politically ostracized. And the entire history of the Chinese in America would have been different, I predict, but it didn't pass. How did this become a national question, getting the attention of the Congress? It's easy to understand if you understand the politics of the last fourth of the 19th century. If you look at the five presidential elections between 1876 and 1896, you will find out that in two of those five cases, the winner of the Electoral College and the winner of the popular vote were different. And in one of the other elections, where the winner of the Electoral College and the popular vote was the same, the winner of the popular vote won in the entire country by 10,000 votes. And what that tells you is those elections were razor thin. Every electoral vote will count. In the election of 1876, the difference in the Electoral College was one vote to elect Rutherford Hayes president. So both parties begin to think of what they need to do to pander 
to those six electoral votes in California and a smattering in Nevada and Oregon that could be the difference in a presidential election. And that nationalizes what was otherwise a local issue in California. Well, this legislation was more than what the United States had bargained for in the negotiation with China. Right? Restriction does not mean for a whole generation. So President Chester A. Arthur <coughs> vetoes this bill. But now they're right back at it, not waiting years, but waiting weeks, even days. And they come back in May of 1882 with legislation that says, Mr. President, if you don't like 20 years, how about 10? And 10 passes. It passed the House of Representatives in 30 minutes. Okay? And President Arthur signed that. When you hear about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, this is the legislation they are talking about. And then there were real heroes. This is a hero. George Frisbee Hoare, Senator from Massachusetts between 1879 and 1904. He was a senator during the entire period of exclusion. He opposed every last exclusion measure. In 1902, which was the last major debate on these topics, Senator Hoer was by that time an elderly senator. He said nothing for a week of debate. Just before the final vote, he rose. And he makes this statement. He says, I'm not going to be for this bill. You can't do anything to it that will improve it, because it is fundamentally against American principles. And he made this statement, and he says, as this bill violates these principles, I am bound to record my protest if I stand alone. Here is the vote. Now, the element, when you think of Chinese exclusion, you think of exclusion from immigration. That's natural, and that's true. But it also involves exclusion from naturalization. And if you want to understand the significance of that, let's go back to our friend William Stewart, the man who filibustered the Sumner Amendment. He was in the Senate a long time, and in 1904, when the law finally passed making it permanent, he claimed his trophy. And he said he'd go back to 1870 and talk about what he did then. If they had been allowed to have become naturalized and become voters, there wouldn't have been any exclusion. If anybody has difficulty connecting the dots between the denial of political rights and the presence of political ostracism, Senator Stewart can connect them for you. This is a great man, Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. Hannibal Hamlin was Abraham Lincoln's first vice president. His committee was the committee that reported the 1879-15 passenger bill. It was not the practice at the time for a committee chairman to bottle legislation in committee that a majority of committees supported. So it came to the floor without recommendation, but Hamlin's recommendation was in the negative. He made a speech denouncing that legislation as a violation of fundamental American principles. And at the end of the speech, this distinguished American said, I leave this vote against this measure. I leave it as a vote the last legacy to my children, right? That they may esteem it the brightest act of my life. His statue stands in Statuary Hall outside the chamber of the U.S. House of Representatives. After the Judy Chu resolution passed, I walked Congresswoman Chu out to that statue to show her this, to tell her this story, and to say, never look at the statue the same way again, because this is a great man. In 1879, he lost. In 2012, we redeemed his legacy. Okay. And that day, when I walked out of the Capitol, I passed by the statue again, I put my hand on his shoe and said just three words, thank you, Senator, and thanks to you.